Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Podcast. Yes, the sun rose on the Tim May Podcast this week. Awesome, Ward. Welcome back in. Are you surprised the sun not only rose, but is glaring right in our uh, windshield as we take off on this episode? Hey, the world keeps spinning, man. Uh, and and not every team is going to win every game they play. Uh, I was definitely wrong about Oregon. Me too. I was wrong about Ohio State. Not sure which team I was more wrong about, to be completely honest, but I know that um, uh, things will proceed in Columbus, Ohio, and there will be a thorough search for answers because there is a lot of season ahead. There's a lot of laundry to get into the washing machine on this episode. Uh, that's back in the get behind the galley, you know, behind first class. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you're exactly right. You know, I think I said this in our in our post game wrap up on the uh, what do you call that rapid reaction. Or rapid mm-hmm. duck, rapid, I guess in that case, rapid ducking uh, after that game on Saturday was, you know, they had a great plan, but that was like personnel pretty much lined up across from each other. Yeah, maybe the stars aren't exactly uh, the total balance, but uh, Oregon looks mo- so much more like an Ohio State or an Alabama or a Clemson than it did in 2014, the last time Ohio State played those guys. And I'm talking about across the board, the, the lines and the uh, – And the other positions, I think you have to agree with me a little bit on that, right? Yeah, I think they were much improved in terms of that personnel from the last time that Ohio State played them head to head. But I still don't think, um, you know, you said that they were they were even. Oh, not even. No, not even. I'm going to get into why they weren't even, but go ahead. Yeah. I mean, they played them to a stalemate uh, or better. Obviously, you look at the results and you can't argue with it. I think that's one of the puzzling things that the laundry that's out there is how Ohio State's offensive line could struggle to, you know, get things moving for the rushing attack and the blocks up front. Uh, and I use that, you know, there are explanations again, as there always are, uh, that we could get into. But the bottom, the, the numbers are the numbers. And Ohio State expects to run for more than 4.1 yards per carry. And they expect to get a lot more pressure uh, than they do, than they did, or they have for the last couple of weeks, really, outside of the Zach Harrison strip sack. Uh, and Oregon's offensive line won that matchup. And and both yeah. of those things are very surprising given the personnel that was actually on the field. Dude, we're going to get into that in a little while. You know what? Bottom line, Ohio State got out played in that game in a lot of key areas, uh, a lot of key moments. Ohio State also got out coached in that game. I mean, yeah. we'll get into that. I mean, Joe Moorhead, oh, my goodness, what a great offensive game plan. When you get some a team in your hip pocket like he did, and you bamboozle them not once, not twice, not three times, but four times on a very similar look, uh, just a little nuance changes. Man, you have really schemed up a team, a team that's struggling to find its identity defensively. Um, you know, that's what Ohio State is facing right now. We're going to get into all that. But I want to get to my my guest for this week because I gave him an assignment last week because he's, he's not retired. He's living up in the Buffalo area. Uh, right outside Orchard Park, where he played football for several years for the Buffalo Bills. Before that, uh, he was a cornerback at Ohio State, Marlon Kerner, one of the great ones to come out of Brookhaven High School back when it was the Cleveland Glenville <laughs> of, uh, of Ohio football, Ohio high school football for a while. Uh, I gave him the assignment of just watch that defense on Saturday. Tell me what you see. And I was expecting him to come back, you know, with after an Ohio State win with all this improvement he saw from the corners and uh, the safety position uh, right on down the line, the linebacker position. But, of course, uh, you know, his grade card uh, didn't show that because anybody watching could see that that was not the case at all. And uh, it is great to have former players on. Like like you guys had Tavis Powell on this week, you know, the uh, at, at Roosters to kind of give you that insight of what, of what maybe older guys, but also what younger players might be dealing with at this point, right? Right, also? Yeah, great great insight as <clears throat> as always from those guys. And if you haven't seen Letterman Live, catch up on that. Uh, because Bobby Carpenter and Tyvis Powell both know a lot about defensive football uh, and you know, go through some of the things that they can and can't do to get this fixed. Uh, and it's it's illuminating to hear them talk about it because these guys who have been part of building that tr- rich tradition for Ohio State on defense, I mean, Tyvis said that it, it would make him cry. And he's, you know, they're not used to seeing this from Ohio State on defense, and, and it's hard for them to stomach and watch. Obviously, that would apply to, to Ohio State fans and, 
certainly the, the current team and the coaching staff and all that as well. But, uh, you know, the people who've been through this uh, and, and helped build it into what it is and establish the tradition, they are just at, at wit's end about what they're watching. Yeah, I would remind Tyvis though he was on that 2012 defense. Well, he yeah he brought Wait a minute, that. Let me up and, and and Bobby was on that 2004 2004 defense, which left a lot to be desired. But they made plays, you know. I mean, especially <laughs> the 2012 defense made plays when it had to. Tyvis still has that football uh, from the Michigan game. No, excuse me, 2013 30. defense. He still has that football from the Michigan game, you know, that saved the day. <laughs> they uh, both they both brought brought up Tim. 2013, where they knew yeah. that there were problems, and Bobby talked about what what was going on in 2004 oh, when yeah. they were three and three. So they, you know, they both they're not saying that because they are perfect and that Ohio State's never had a bad defense or They've anything. Been like through that. it, yeah. Both of those guys have been through it, and as part of really elite units and units that have gone through periods like this one is right now. And all of that, they've been through it, and they also saw kind of drastic change on their side of the ball from a coaching standpoint that got them out of it the next year to a certain extent, you know? So, yeah, I mean, who knows where we are? We're going to get into that, the crossroads. Are we at a, are we at a crossroads right here, you and I, as we look at this Ohio State defense? But, you know, let's get to my conversation with Marlon Kern. It was extremely interesting, a little bit long, but, you know, you and I are used to long conversations, right, Awesome? That's right. As promised, ladies and gentlemen, a blast from the past who's got a – I hopefully put a blowtorch on what's up with this Ohio State defense. I welcome to the Tim May Podcast for the first time ever, hopefully not the last. Uh, Marlon Kerner, welcome to the Tim May Podcast. Thanks for having me, Tim. It's been way too long. You know, you played cornerback uh, back in the mid-90s, early mid-90s, when Ohio State was getting its act back together, I want to call it defensively, you know, building toward those teams of the of the mid to late 90s and uh, – uh, just to ask you straight up, Marlon, you played in the NFL also for several years with the Buffalo Bills. How tough was it to watch what happened Saturday uh, to the Ohio State Buckeyes, especially the Ohio State defense? You know, it, it was really tough to watch because, like every other fan, I, I think I was I had I held the hope of we're going to somehow find a way to win this game, right? Because yeah. we've always done that. Hey, we we didn't we don't start fast. We kind of get behind and then somehow, some way our offense or somebody will make a great play and bail us out uh, and, and we'll find a way to either win by seven, win by three. Um, the name of the game was just to win the game, right? Um, yeah, or, or get, the, yeah, get to overtime, something. Yeah. yeah, get to overtime, something and find a way to win it. Um, see if Oregon would make a mistake. You know, and and one, you got to tip your hat to Oregon. I think yeah. they played lights out. I mean, I, I came into the game with some questions of, could their secondary hold up against our receiving core? Check. They did that. Could they get pressure with their front four without blitzing? Check. They did that. Could their offensive line hold up against our defensive line? Check. They did that. Um, and then could they take advantage of the young linebacking core that we have and get them to kind of do what they've been doing since last season, really, um, and not really hit the run fits like they're supposed to? Check. They did all those things. And then when you, it comes down to it, their quarterback played with a lot more poise when the game was on the line. He made the plays that he needed to, um, and we came up just a little bit short. Yeah. You know, I would go back to that one check mark he had about their defensive secondary uh, uh, covering Ohio State with great aplomb. What they did is I thought they challenged the Ohio State receivers all day. And then, like you said, in crunch time, they came up with plays, you know, but Right. When you throw for 400, 400 and almost almost 500 yards passing, you know, you've given up a little bit defensively, but you're right. right. But, I mean, it I wasn't, but it wasn't one of those things where it was like a yes. gradual process. Like, you yeah. know, like up in the first half, like they were, they played tough. They challenged us. They yeah. were knocking balls away. Uh, and then we didn't really get our first touchdown until you caught them looking at wristbands. Like, I don't understand how you don't have something built into, hey, listen, if they come out and they're lining up, we go this coverage immediately, but yeah. that's something that Oregon's coaching staff needs to figure out, but we caught them. And then it kind of, we kind of slowly kind of started chipping away at it. We made some good adjustments in the second half. I mean, but for the most part, what you didn't see was guys running through their secondary free guys running through for 77 yards, quick strikes. They made us earn it. Like, you know, we might get a 25 yard touch pass here. And then it was like, okay, let's line up. 
let's line up, get back to get back to basics. And then we kind of had to slowly, methodically move down the field and it chewed up the clock um, because we're a big, big play team. If If we can hit you quick, the momentum gets on our side and then we can kind of break people's wills. But they did a pretty good job of making us really methodically move the ball down the field. Yeah, I thought they got scores, touchdowns at exactly the right times in that game, which I I don't know if killed the wills right the right term, but, you know, Ohio State had 600 and almost 50 yards total offense in that game. But right. like you just said, Oregon made the plays when it needed to make the plays in the red zone on the other side of the 50 yard line, you know, because I mean, it was, it was really like watching, you know, it was like, it's almost like baiting somebody, Hey, come on over the 50. And then you're not going anywhere in the first half. Second half, Ohio State did hit a few big plays, but you're, you're exactly right. I wanted to ask you this though. You just touched on it. The kid looking at his wristband and getting caught and Garrett Wilson running right by him. What I want to get into with you is can you be, can you be too uh, coachy? in football anymore if you follow them. I mean, every everything has to come from the sideline. You know what I mean? I mean, you saw Ohio State. They've got a turnstile effect going on uh, with the guys running onto the field, running off the field and stuff. And I don't know, uh, as you're looking at that defense, I think that that has caused as much of a lack of confidence or a lack of continuity with that defense as anything else. Is you got new bodies in the game. It seems like every time you blink your eye. But just what was your take on watching that? You know, when I watched that um, on Oregon side, I was like, wow, that's that's pretty amazing that they're actually looking at wristbands to call defensive play calls. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah, you know, normally your game plan and, and and now the game is definitely evolved from when I played um, at Ohio State. So I get it. There's a lot going on. There's a lot more spread offense. There's a lot more movement. There's a lot more things that go into trying to figure out how you want to defend a certain team in an offense and the plays that they want to run. But you have to understand as a defender, they're lined up like as soon as you see them run on the field and sprint, you know, and to your point, yes, there is over coaching. There never should be a time when you get caught looking at your wristband, especially since it happened last week. (laughs) So if it happens in week one, you got to know that we've got to be better getting and quicker getting the play call in. And you tell your free safety, if, if you see them come out of the huddle and they're sprinting to the line, you call this immediately. Your linebacker and your free safety has got to call. Like, we're calling this now, and we line up, and we play it. And if it gets us in a bad position, so be it. But at least you're playing football, and you have a chance. Like, there's no way you let a receiver run by you, and you turn. And, I mean, literally, he was like this, looking down at his wrist. Yeah. And the safety's looking down, and he's five yards behind everybody. I'm like, that can't happen. Yeah. But it did. Hey. Uh, it did. <laughs> so, you're, so, you're looking at this Ohio State defense now. Uh, obviously – I gave kudos to Kerry Combs, the defense coordinator, for coming up to the interview room. It took a while, but he got up there, and we asked him some tough questions, including about, you know, I asked him about, you know, definitely, he, you know, about feeling the heat, you know, because Ohio State fans are not are not satisfied at all. I mean, they're very disappointed because there were times, I mean, three times, at least in that game, they got flanked on the left side. It was kind of like uh, watching a Civil War reenactment, you know? Uh, yeah. Uh, one time you go, okay, you learn from that. Second time you go, okay, somebody slipped or something. Third time you go, uh, uh-uh, they're getting out coached, but they're getting out coached. It's almost like they're out coaching themselves too, you know, in a, in a lot of regards. Uh, just, I don't know what, as you look at it now, I mean, you know, you're a 48 year old man. You can look back on it. I remember those when you played cornerback in the in Ohio state and in the NF, NFL, y'all might take a linebacker out and put a, put a nickel back in you know, occasionally you might sub a defensive lineman every now and then, but pretty much the nine or 10 guys were kind of the core of the defense. They learned to play with each other, learned to recognize things. I'm asking you about four questions at once, Marlon. I'm known for that. Yes. Sorry. You remember me from when you I were high school. Yes. <laughs> but, but the bottom line is, as you look at this defense right now, what would be your first quick fix for, or is there a quick fix for what you're, for what you saw? I think there's a couple of issues that that are going that's going on. Right. One, they're young. Um, so you can't substitute experience like you can't make guys figure it out faster. They have to be able to see it. They have to be able to recognize it and they have to be able to say, I've been here before. I know what this is going to look like. Um, I, what I thought Oregon did very well was is they did a good job of taking the same play, but kind of giving it little different wrinkles so that, oh, is this the same play? I'm not sure. Uh, and then boom, oh yeah, it is the same. It's the same similar play, but just a different formation, different execution. Um, and it was something that 
it caused a lot of issues because we also were very stubborn in the fact that we're going to play man to man. We're going to line up in it. We're not going to show you anything different. We didn't move. We didn't show a cover to shell a time. Like you didn't really do too much of anything to make their quarterback or their center say, okay, I know they might be in this, but if they run this, I don't know. So we just got up and said, okay, we're, it was almost like we're Ohio state. We're going to play man to man and see if you can beat us. Um, and, and so it looked like that a lot at times. Uh, and so Oregon executed and beat us. I think when you talk about the youth and inexperience, like there's some similar, there's some basic football concepts that you have to understand, right? If you play man to man and as my man, I'm playing man to man and he cracks on the inside guy, I have to replace and I have to set the edge as a corner. And for some reason, that concept was lost on our cornerbacks the entire game. They, they were really lost on the fact that my man cracked and blocked. I've got to get up. I've got to set the edge. I've got to turn that ball back. And so even when it, you saw it, like they still were outflanked. They didn't recognize it fast enough. Then you had a tackle coming out, getting to the edge with the running back, and they were just sealing everything. And you could either do a couple of things. You could say, okay, you know what? I don't like that. I'm going to bring my corner down. I'm going to make him play hard and make him play cover too, because then it means that that receiver can't come crack me unless you want to have the tackle come out and pull on me. And then hopefully everyone will see it and run and flow to it. Yeah. So we never did that. Our corners are off about seven yards. He cracks on the linebacker corner follows the receiver right to where he cracks. And then he looks like, Oh shoot. And you're like, okay, it's, it's a jailbreak. So that we have to go back to that. We have to kind of fix. That was probably the most disappointing point um, that I kept seeing was because at some point in time, you want your cornerbacks to figure out that this is what they're doing. Um, this is how they're attacking us. And for some reason, I'm not sure what the game plan was or what they were teaching in that defensive back room, but they never were able to recognize that. But I can guarantee you um, if it happens again this week, they will figure that out. The corners will be flying up trying to make tackles um, on and, and be, be a good, do a better job of crack replace. Yeah. If it happens this week, you know, the next couple of weeks, they play Tulsa and Akron, you know, I mean, you know, even if we, even if we are watching this and we see improvement, are we really seeing improvement? I mean, uh, true. Uh, well, what do you, what do you get? What do you get uh, the next couple of weeks? And, you know, cause y'all, y'all played kind of games like that too, you know, where, and you can't get almost a false sense of security, uh, that you've fixed everything when in fact you haven't you haven't fixed anything with, against a team that either has the ability to beat you or the quality to beat you you know what I'm saying I mean what do you what do you get out of the next two weeks just to is it is it important the next couple of weeks just to get a feeling of confidence like a for yes. lack of another term it's important to really build that sense of confidence right and and really one to build the continuity like even though on paper is going to, you're going to say we should be able to beat these next two win these next two games right you still want to be able to say okay you know what i have a better understanding of how we should play in this defense i have a better understanding of how teams are going to attack us in this defense um you you got young guys um that maybe can say we we can do a better job of disguising what we're going to be in um linebackers need to be able to run fit better because it's still going to be a copycat league teams are going to say here's what hurt them yeah. And let's figure out how we can do that. It may not be the same play, um, but they might find a different wrinkle to try to figure out if they can expose um, that young linebacking core in the secondary and see if they can have some success um, in moving the ball. And and you and I know if, if you can stay in a game long enough, then the pressure become the pressure gets greater on the team that's expected to win. Uh, and so now you're putting the pressure on hey, if, if, if I don't perform well and they're moving the ball and they're scoring and the game's close at the end then can I execute down the stretch to be able to win that game? Uh, and we saw yesterday that Oregon executed greatly um, and really did everything they were supposed to do. And we came up just a little bit short and couldn't really force that tie. Um, we had plenty of opportunities really to tie the game up um, and even maybe even have a chance to take the lead, um, but we didn't execute. They, they did better. And so you want that. You want them to be able to just get the confidence of we helped. We got them out three and out. We, we've got it back. Our defense did this. We kept we kept them under a certain yardage. Um, and you want to just be able to do that to say, when we get to the Big Ten, you know what's going to happen. You know what's coming when we get into conference play. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, uh, uh, it was funny how Ohio State offensively did get back into the game in a pretty big way. But like I said, it just seemed like Oregon scored that touchdown. It just kept them ahead, that two touchdown and then one touchdown, you know, kind of playing with house money. And right. then number three, the Ohio State offense had to be perfect 
in the fourth quarter, almost perfect to, to get it done. And the defense did get the ball back for the offense a couple of times there that gave them a shot, but then they couldn't deliver. Like you're just talking about suddenly Oregon's calling the right blitz at the right time there. You know, they got snookered a few times uh, too. Jackson Smith and Jigba. That was a great play by him, CJ Stroud and him to uh, recognize what was going on there. Uh, basically zero in the middle there and just run across and get that touchdown. Uh, but like you said, it was too little ends up being too little too late. Uh, let me ask one more thing about the defense. We'll move for a cornerback. You know, we saw Ohio State replacing cornerbacks yesterday, just like everybody else uh, in the positions on the uh, defensive side. Second game, the biggest game of the year probably up until they play Penn State on their schedule. You know, uh, what's just what's your what's your take on that? That second game of the year, you're still trying to maybe figure out who your best player is there, even though it kind of looks like you might know that answer, but just. Well, just I don't know. How does that affect a person, an individual, when they're going in, playing a few plays, and then coming out? You know, it makes it difficult to really um, get a feel for the game, kind of get a flow for how they're attacking you. you you're yeah. trying to figure out the receiver's release, um, try to get a feel for their speed, how they run certain routes, right? You want to get all this kind of thing. And so when you're only in for a play or two, and then you come back, you're like, man, like I was just kind of getting in a groove where I just started getting a sweat going and now I'm back on the sideline waiting to get another opportunity again. And so it, it, it can be hard um, to kind of really get adjusted in, into a game. Uh, so you really have to be dialed in on taking mental reps and staying beside your coach and listening to what they're saying of, OK, they're running this because you might go back in two plays later. So if you're not beside the defense coordinator, your position back um, or your position coach, just kind of listening, saying, okay, what is he saying? What is he seeing? What checks are we making here? Um, then it makes it very difficult. And I'm not sure if they do that or not. I, I would assume they do, yeah. but those are the ways you kind of combat kind of getting cycled in. You kind of have to say, okay, what are they doing? And then it's very important to then talk to the guy coming off the field when you get a chance, hey, what are they doing? What are you seeing? How is he releasing on this route? When he did this, what did you notice? Um, uh, did he come slow? Did he go fast? Did he did he did he give you any tendencies to say he was going to run that type of route? Um, so you can kind of understand and have a total package and a total picture. Uh, and those are all the things that you need to do to really be successful to kind of say, yes, I, I understand we're going to rotate our defensive backs. And that's the level you have to get to be successful if you're going to continue to play that style of defense. You're a man who played, like I said, at the highest level in, in, uh, in college football, the highest level. Well, NFL is the highest level. It's like saying the NBA, you know, you play at the highest level of the NBA. Yeah. Uh, when you see quarterbacks giving 10 yards, sometimes more cushion uh, in the heart of a game, I'm talking about in the second half for Ohio State, uh, does that just tell you right away either that's a really bad defense approach or does that tell you right away there's a lack of confidence there? What, 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 you know, because you saw that uh, at times throughout the second half. It's, it's numbing to me uh, to, to see a secondary that – I don't know if lack of aggressiveness is the right term, just basically lack of coverage in certain key moments. But uh, – and you're almost giving away, you know, eight or ten yards. Hey, I don't know. What's, what's your view of that? You know, I, I think what it was – you can kind of take it one of two ways, right? I've, I've been on that side of – when you kind of back off a little bit, you're going to say, I'm going to give you a certain route. I'm going to come up, I'm going to make the tackle because you're not really confident of how you're playing. So you're trying to make sure you don't give up the big play. Definitely been there, seen that. So I understand that mentality. But I think it's also an adjustment you can try to make as a defensive coordinator to say, back up a little bit, right? If we're going to play at six or seven, hey, back up about nine or 10. Because what I want you to do is be able to kind of, hopefully you can see the play develop because you have a little bit more cushion. So you're, you're hoping that the cornerback is kind of reading what they're doing and that maybe he might see, okay, the receiver went, and he's going to go crack on the linebacker and I need to replace quicker and get up there. So you're kind of giving them a little opportunity to maybe diagnose a play because they are so young. Um, but I agree, like, yeah, like giving them that amount of cushion, it was like taking candy from a baby, right? Like, you're just like, yeah. hey, go ahead, because the out was there all game. Like, they could get a, a 10 yard out easy because of the way we were playing. Uh, yeah. And then they also did some good, a good job of scheming um, and attacking us when they knew, okay, we're not going to play man to man. They're going to play cover two, but we're going to be off playing cover two. So they did a really good job uh, on the one, the one when they got a really big first down. Uh, they did an outside flood 
and they they ran it a little differently because you had somebody go a deep flat to occupy the corner. You had the tight end run a seven cut, but then you had a second, the third guy run a seven cut right at the safety. So the seventh, the second seven cup is wide open. Yes. And the cornerback never hinged. He never hinged, right? Like those are just basic techniques you're looking at. And cover two, you have to know if somebody comes to the flat quick, we call it hinge technique. I'm playing deep to short. I'm going to play to take away that seven cut to help my safety out. And I'm going to break on the flat. So I really want you to throw the, I want you to throw the out. I want you to throw the flat and the corner jumped the flat seven cuts behind it. And now you have a blocker on the safety right now. So that's going to be a big play. And I thought that was a great play design. And again, the youth and inexperience of our secondary, not recognizing how they want to attack you. It's trips. You know, that's, that's the number one rule when you play cover two is trips. If it's trips, corner you got to help your safety because he can't cover both of those guys if they both run, if one runs a go route run with a seven cut one's got to give up you're going to give up one uh and so those are just kind of things that you kind of have to understand and realize and see and you can't really you can talk about it you can say it all you want in the meeting you have to understand it and recognize it and see it in games in gameplay and see it in game speed and that was something that you could see the youth and the experience of our secondary really showed up in big moments yeah Boy, uh, you know, too bad you don't have any excitement about the game anymore. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, just the the fervor in your voice is really cool. And number two, you're exactly right. Number three, that is a snooker. That's called an offensive right. coordinator snookering the other team. I mean, one of my, you know, I don't know, favorites. One, one of the plays I really appreciated, for example, was back Illinois, back in the late 80s, maybe early 90s, may, maybe even when you were there. They were great about running a tight end, like faking a tight end block and then running him over the middle and then the the running back releasing and following him through the same area. You know what I mean? And and it's kind of reminded me of like that play you're talking about in other plays I saw yesterday from Oregon because all of a sudden it's like, well, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. You know, that's what you're getting from the defense. And uh, oh, my goodness is not the way to, to play cover defense, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> but again, I mean, those it's are like things Oscar, you Oscar. Look at you. Yeah, you're like, hey, wait a minute. And so you, you you talk about it. And when if you've seen a lot of defense, you can kind of go back and say, okay, wait a minute. I, I saw this at when we played Penn State last year. This is how yeah. they attack. It's great. We're going to do that. This is just what we're going to do to adjust that. They're so young that they don't have a lot of experience to draw upon. Uh, and so they they're, some of these guys are seeing this for the first time and seeing – just guys get attacked in a certain way where you just don't understand the concept of how we play our defense this particular way, because everyone has their own little wrinkle of how they want to play man to man, what concepts they want to use, how they're going to attack a certain team. And Oregon is off as a coordinator being at Penn state. He had some success against us when he had those teams. He, he knew how to give us wrinkles and kind of give us some issues. So you knew you had you should have been going back looking at how maybe Penn State attacked us and maybe added some of that into the game plan and say, you know what, they may kind of add some of these plays and maybe attack us in this manner. And, and it was spot on what they were doing. Like they gave us fits all game. Uh, and even though our offense was able to move the ball in the second half and move the ball mightily in the second half, it still wasn't enough to overcome the 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 deficiencies that our defense showed throughout the entire game. Yeah, it's funny. Joe Moorhead tried to run a lot of that in the SEC when he was a head coach at Mississippi State for a couple of years. He didn't have the personnel, you know what I mean? But no. it, it's 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 kind of cool uh, to see a, a pretty sharp mind with a great scheme and personnel, right? And that, right. I, think, I think Ohio State and everybody got a little bit of a lesson in that uh, on Saturday. Sure did. And, and you bring up a good point, right, the personnel. I think when you look at some of the great coaches, coaches understand – where their players are, what their personnel can do, and more importantly, what personnel they have to play, what scheme they want to do. Yeah. And so you can come in and say, oh, you want, we're a man-to-man team, we're going to do that. But at some point in time, you have to say, you know what, as much as I want to run man-to-man and do some things, we're not there yet. So we need to mix up some coverages, do some things to put our guys in the best situations. And yes, third and three, third and five, you're going to have to run man-to-man. You can't sit in zone because they'll pick you apart. But you can definitely disguise some things. You can do some blitzing a little bit better to get some pressure. And I think that was the difference. We never really got that offense really in too, in too many situations where they had to be perfect and not make mistakes. And when you, when you have a 14-point cushion, even though we got them, they had the lead. Like, okay, they turned the ball over. Well, you got to go score. We still had the lead. Like, even though it's a seven-point game, stop us. Stop us if you can. Yeah. Uh, and that was really the difference. Like, they really did a good job of just exploiting some of the things that we showed last season 
showed week one against Minnesota, uh, and then it continued yesterday. Marlon, Kerner, can this defensive staff, can this defense, as it sits right now, and like I said, you're sitting, where are you sitting right now? What is the city? I'm sitting in Buffalo. Yeah. Are you actually in Buffalo or one of the Buffalo suburbs? And one of the Buffalo suburbs, about 15 minutes from the stadium. Um, yeah. I live in Lancaster, New York. Rich Stadium, which you're trying to replace and uh, get a stadium downtown, right, or a little bit then, better. You know what? The, the talk is to build it across the street and leave it in Orchard Park. Uh, oh. So we'll see how that, that goes. Um, more land, a little bit easier. Um, you can just build one on the other side, knock the yeah. other one down, and make it a parking lot and still have tailgating. Like everybody else does, except right. I, I covered games at Rich Stadium back in the late 70s, early 80s when I was covering the Browns and the Bengals. And uh, that thing, that place, I, I, the best way I describe it is in late November, December, it felt like you were sitting in a refrigerator. <laughs> the bottom shelf of a refrigerator, you know. But, exactly, uh, yes. A yeah. lot of crosswinds, a lot of swirling winds, a lot of, a lot of everything there. And I think yeah. that you have to have an outdoor stadium if you build a new one because – that's what gives them kind of an advantage in the upper hand, like a dome kind of evens the playing field and you have to just make it an outdoor stadium, make it like it's supposed to be. Never know what the element's going to be. And when you get the Miami dolphins here in November, December, they don't want to play because it's too cold. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. Cause I remember I grew up in Texas, man, Alabama and Texas. And I remember I moved up here and uh, anyway, that's another story, but getting re- getting used to the cold was definitely a, uh, an acclimation kind of thing. But don't want to get back to this. Does Ohio State have the, from what you've seen, you know, a lot of people are clamoring right now for the, you know, get somebody other than Kerry Combs as defensive coordinator, shuffle the staff, do something. And you look at the staff and you kind of wonder what they could do, what they would do, uh, and then personnel wise, you know. But as you look at it from afar, that's the reason I was asking where you were sitting uh, with you and your lovely family there. Uh, uh, what would you do right now, man? I mean, what what would be your first move if you uh, were the genie that could make some uh, just uh, moves with your baton? What would you do right now with this defense? You know, honestly, I I don't think I would make a move um, and make any ch- and coaching changes. I think that's always the first thing that everybody says. We we want to call us. We got to change. We got to change. I think what needs to happen is is you need to kind of sit down as a head coach and a defensive staff and say, okay. What is our philosophy? What are we trying to do? What do we want to do? You know, because every year is different, right? And so the really good coaches will come back and say, okay, listen, we know we want to be a man-to-man team. We want to do certain things, but do we have the personnel to do that? Uh, and so you sit down, you look at what you have, you say, okay, who does what well? Who does this well? What are they not good at? Uh, and then what do we want to do? And then how does their strengths and their weaknesses fit into the scheme that we want to employ? And then do we need to make any changes? Uh, so that's the first thing. I think the second thing you need to do is go back to basics, right? I think sometimes, as you talked about overcoaching, we can sometimes complicate things uh, on defense and, and have a thousand checks and have a thousand. If they do this, we do this. If they get in this formation, you check this. And so what that does is it makes you think. And football on defense, you want to be really reactive. You just want to fly around, make plays. I see it, I diagnose it, I go and I make plays. So I think you can kind of go back and look at your playbook and say, let's simplify this. Let's make this basic, more simple for these guys so they can just fly around and make plays. But then let's go back and get with the basic formats um, and the foundations that here's some formations we want to run. Here's, Here's some concepts we really want you to hone in on. We need you to understand Listen, crack replace is a basic concept in football if you play corner. And we need to really drill down on that and kind of make you understand how this works, right? And then you need to just tell guys it's okay to ask questions. Because I remember as an 18 and a 19-year-old kid coming out, and I played quarterback in high school. So cornerback was foreign to me, right? I'm in a room with guys who know it. I'm trying to get this defense down. So sometimes I'm afraid to raise my hand and say, I don't get it, right? So you need to create an environment where – it's okay to say, I don't understand. And so maybe you bring in former players, you bring in guys that maybe played at the next level that you say, you know what, I just want you to bring in and kind of just talk to this guy, kind of get a feel for where he is, help him understand what we're trying to do on defense, whether that's bring in some linebackers um, that have played at a high level that made it to the next level, talk to those guys and say, hey, if you're not playing, come back and just kind of come in and talk to guys or even do a Zoom call like we're doing and just kind of help guys understand because, you don't understand what people are really, obviously there's a disconnect, right? You can talk about it all you want in the meeting room and they can say, yes, I got it. And they might even be able to do it in practice, 
but when they get in the game, they're not executing. So that tells me there's a disconnect between really what they say they're saying, they understand, and then when it's time to execute, what really they're processing and, and really doing at the time. So we need to fix those things. And then if it continues, then you may have to revisit and say, hey, do we need to make a change in, in, in certain coaching positions? But I don't like doing that during the season because it's not like you're going to fix anything. Right. Yeah. It's not like you're going to reinstall a new defense and say, we're going to learn everything, scrap what we've been doing. Yeah. It's just somebody's going to kind of maybe say, I want to add a little wrinkle here or add a little twist here and do something different. So, you know, if you're going to make a change, in my opinion, you decide to make a change at the end of the season. Uh, does the one high safety look, especially the way Ohio State has employed it? It's a total different. It's a total different defense when you had Josh Proctor back there, who, by the way, looks like he's gone for the year because it suffered a a pretty, I guess, gruesome uh, broken leg in that game, uh, which is too bad. He was coming off getting his shoulder banged up in the previous game. And to the Bryson Shaw kid, number 17, who obviously took a bad angle on that run up the gut. Uh, uh, you know, I'm talking about, what was that? You know, the Verdell's kid. 77-yard run, yeah. So, yeah, you remember, you remember, you remember the number. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, do, do, does that work? I mean, does the one eye safety look work unless you've just got one of the greatest safeties in football back there? I'm talking about an eraser guy uh, who has also patience and poise. And, uh, you know, obviously uh, Bryson Shaw is kind of learning on the job. He's been around for a couple of years, but what, what, just give me your take on just that approach defensively. I mean, again, I think, I think it goes back to the, you need to understand your personnel, right? Yeah. Like, but Proctor out, he would understand the angle I need to come at, down at to make this play. Uh, Shaw didn't, right? He came down, took a bad angle, and then you just open up a lane to the outside. And you're playing, again, you're playing man to man. Yes. So once he pops, like it, to me, it was, it was baffling to me because the linebacker had a chance to fill the hole, but he ran with his man. Like he ran right to the tight end and really took himself out of the play yes. and got popped. And I'm like, okay, this again – Again, youth didn't didn't understand the concept, recognize it at all. I'm playing the man to man. I got to close the distance and get to his hip. That's what he's thinking. That's my yes. man. I got to get to him. So again, good play design. And once he pops it, all bets are off. You have to understand as a safety, I've got to come down. I've got to get in control. I can't come in and try to take and make a big shot because he's already got the first down. My job now as a safety is to get him down. Right. Um, and then these are all the things that as a young safety – you don't understand sometimes. And so it still goes back to they haven't played a lot of football together. And then there's young enough that they just haven't seen enough reps to understand, you know what? I can't take a big shot here. I can't take this angle. Like I've got to come in under control. I got to take the air out of it, but give, give him a one way go. He had a two way go. He could have broke either way. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, okay, yeah, as a safety, you're dead in the water. My job is to get down, take away the inside and just get and get to that inside hip and then get him down by any means necessary. If he runs me over, great. But I've got to get him down so we can line up on defense and recoup and just kind of say, okay, guys, let's get back to it. We've got it. We're okay here. Good execution on our part. Now let's go execute on this play. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, uh, when I give Verdell's credit for it too, C.J. Verdell's that running back, he used the 12th man, his 12th man on offense, the umpire. <laughs> you, know, to little, you know, and uh, Bryson Shaw was going go under or over the umpire. Yeah, he tried to go under, and then he lost any leverage he had right. on that. And it was, you know, Cam Brown almost ran him down from the backside. But uh, you're right. I, hey, I wanted to ask you this, too. I mean, as a former defensive player, to watch a team run on your former team like, like two straight weeks, two straight games now teams have done – that really does cut your heart out, doesn't it? I mean, I mean, as a if you can't stop them, like Brian Day talked about that after the game, like Ohio State did not get that running attack established, even though they threw for over four hundred yards, almost five hundred yards. Uh, running, being able to run the ball against another team still matters big time in this spread age. And what does it do to a defense when a team is repeatedly getting that, you know, that that big gain when it needs it, running the ball? it's demoralizing when teams can run the ball because now they have the entire complement of their yeah. offensive playbook they can call, right? You, you know, Hey, I can run here. I can call this. I can call a pass. I can call a screen. I can call whatever, like whatever Oregon called yesterday, it worked for the most part. And then you look at Ohio state. Like I looked at some of the fourth downs you have like fourth and two, that is a running down. Uh, and for us to throw the football on fourth and two, really showed 
um, it told me where where we felt confident at, right? I felt more comfortable throwing the ball in a situation where normally we would sit down and say, okay, my offensive line is going to dominate your defensive line, and I want you to know I'm going to run the ball, and I'm still going to run the ball and still get the first down. Uh, yeah. and, and so w- there was instances when we tried it and got stood up and stymied at the point of attack. And so now it means their offense can pin their ears back because they know now, okay, they're not going to run the ball. They're going to throw the ball when it's down. And I can, I can dial up so many different things. I can, I can disguise some things. And again, one of the things that I also saw that I forgot to mention was they did a really good job of disguising their defensives um, and their coverages and really kind of giving CJ Stroud fits uh, in the first half. I thought he settled down in the second half and made some better throws. Um, But even in, in the last series, like they gave him some fits. He didn't recognize that the blitz was coming. So they did a very good job, and and that's where it helps, especially when you have a young team. It it helps when you haven't seen a lot of football. So you're like, I don't know if this is this coverage, that coverage. And that's where if you're one-dimensional, it's always in the defensive favor. Yeah, crazy, man. I mean, you know, and you look at that game yesterday in Oregon. Now, Oregon didn't have a great defensive game. They had a timely defensive game, giving up over 600 yards of offense. But, my goodness, they were missing – Finally, they were missing three of their best players. Their top three players probably on defense weren't – well, two of their top three weren't on the field. Three of their better players weren't on the field, and uh, including, uh, you know, Kayvon Thibodeau. They're maybe the number one guy in the, in the draft next year, you know, the defensive right. end. But their they're really playmaker de- uh, linebacker was missing. Then they lost another line- – they had lost another linebacker last week also in that game against Fresno State. And then they lost a game – they lost a linebacker uh, early in the se- early in the first half, but they were able to basically get it done when they had to, right? And that pretty much is the essence of modern football, isn't it? When there's two really good teams going at each other, make yeah. a play when it matters. Yep, make a play. And, you know, honestly, I thought the fact that Thibodeau wasn't there actually made them play better because you weren't going to rely on one guy to get it done. It meant that your secondary had to be dialed in, your safeties had to be really loaded, your linebackers had to fly around and make plays because – you knew, hey, we might not get a pass rush. He might sit around all day back there. So I thought him being absent, but having his presence on the sideline, encouraging his teammates, kind of being an extra coach, kind of helping get guys in the right place, really played to the advantage of what Oregon was trying to do on defense. And and then when it came down to it, like you said, somebody stepped up and made plays. And that's the name of the game, right? Like their depth, their experience kind of showed there. we, We were wondering like, okay, can they match up athletically? Will Ohio, well, can they run with Ohio State? Can Ohio State run with their guys? Yeah, across the board, it was even. They had speed for speed. Guys could run with guys. So now it's, can we execute in the crunch time? And I thought they started out great. They started out fast. They, they kind of slowed us. And we've been showing that we're a slow starting team in the first half anyway. Um, and then they kind of really took away the big play to kind of ignite the crowd. And the crowd was a difference. I mean, when you come on the road, the first thing you, the, bl- the blueprint is, Take away the crowd because, you know, if the crowd gets going, it can be a long day. And you saw when the crowd got going, they had a false start, a delayed game like the crowd was a factor, but they really weren't really that big of a factor for most of the game until and, until some crunch, crunch moments in the fourth quarter. And then they couldn't really get into it in the last series because they executed so well. Yeah, I was going to say it was it was crazy. I, I'm not blaming the crowd at all. I thought the crowd was pretty damn good yesterday. They were loud. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, and it was funny because when Ohio State would get the ball there in the fourth quarter, you remember that? Uh, it was almost like you were at a tennis match. You know? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Everybody's doing this. and yeah. <laughs> C.J. Stroud's about to serve. Yeah, exactly. Hey, uh, Marlon, man, appreciate you coming on the Tim A. Podcast. You still play the trumpet, man. I mean, you and I had that in common. We played the – we learned how to play the trumpet when we were way back when we were little guys. You still play the trumpet or did you put that away? Well, a long time? Um, I put the trumpet away um, because once I got to high school, the trumpet was kind of done. I would play a little bit, um, but I was not marching in marching band, playing the trumpet in, in football equipment, which is what the, the band director wanted me to do. Uh, and then it was kind of a cool. I ended up getting my trumpet and my oldest son ended up playing the trumpet. So his first trumpet was my trumpet that I played as a young, young kid growing up. So that was pretty cool to see. So he loved that part until he bought his own trumpet. He had to go get a silver platinum trumpet. It was nice, nice looking, but it was cool to hand down my trumpet to my son. Yeah. I went from a bronze to this, uh, uh, I actually played cornet, you know, basically as a squished trumpet. Uh, but I went from a bronze to a, uh, real beautiful King, uh, silver plated cornet at one point. And man, that was, uh, that was so, and now, like an idiot, I gave it away to a guy uh, right after 
right after high school and never saw it again. He never gave me the money for it. You know what I mean? So right, right. I wish I, I, wish I had it now just to put up on the wall and just go, yeah, I used to, yeah, I used to play that thing right there. And uh, I've mean, always pictured you though. I mean, you had that smoothness about you. I always figured you'd be a, end up being a jazz guy, you know, in some amateur jazz band or something somewhere up in the Buffalo area playing near the airport or something, you know? <laughs> well, maybe I'll pick it back up. I mean, you know, I'm about to have that empty nest here in a few years, so maybe yeah. I'll try to pick up the trumpet again. Yeah, I'm looking at my son's trumpet up on the uh, across the way from me up on a, a bureau, and uh, he played. One of my sons played for a while, but he kind of gave it up in high school and things like that too. It's, it's funny, but when you get an appreciation for music, just to be able to read music is a you know I think that's a I think that's an accomplishment in your life, you know, and uh, something you ought to be feel good about. Hey, real quick, uh, how many kids you got and Give me a little background on you so people can kind of keep up with what happened to Marlon Kern. Okay. Um, so left football, um, well, got, got drafted by the Bills, um, double ACL in case they didn't know that, um, yeah. kind of transitioned out of football. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, I like what you said, that kind of transition. Go ahead now. <laughs> kind of transition. Now they're kind of like, hey, you can't run fast anymore. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Give me some time to get healthy. No. Uh, and so that was kind of the end of me playing football. Uh, and then, uh, met a young lady up here. Um, we ended up getting married uh, in 2000, uh, moved back to Buffalo, uh, stayed away from football for a very, very, very long time, uh, and then ended up getting back with the Buffalo Bills um, The la- about six years ago, started as the director of alumni and then transitioned to director of player engagement um, before transitioning this past season um, to the community director for a nonprofit called E Forever. Uh, so oh. Yeah. I'm still locally up here. Love what I'm doing. I get to help assist small businesses um, kind of scale and grow their business. Uh, so I'm loving it. Um, and I made a lot of connections just being um, in this community uh, and, and working for the organization for such a long time. So looking forward to really just giving back to the community. Um, I have We have three children. Um, they are now 20, 18, and 16. Uh, so one is a junior at the University of Buffalo. He runs track there. He did not play football. Uh, and he just made the academic MAC team um, for the spring because um, he has a 3.7 GPA. So doing well in college. My daughter just graduated high school uh, and she is now a freshman attending Hilbert University or Hilbert College. Uh, and then my son is a junior in high school and he is playing football um, oh, for playing. Lancaster High School. So he's the only one that played football. Um, and so we're kind of figuring it out because he picked up football a little late. He was like, I don't like it. I don't like it. Uh, and then he got with his friends and said, I like football and I want to play. Uh, yeah. And I'm like, OK, so we didn't start football until about the seventh or eighth grade up this way. So he's got some catching up to do. Um, and just again, kind of like our young guys on our team just hasn't seen a lot of football. So still trying to process everything um, and doesn't process it at the speed that probably his coaches would like him to do it. Yeah. Does he have the quicks, though? Does he does he have the Marlon Kerner quicks? No, no, he's not as fast as I am. And I always mess with him and tell him, like, me, my 16-year-old, you, myself, I guess, your 16-year-old self, I'm smoking you all day. There's no way you're going to beat me in a foot race. Hey, dude, real quick before you go, because uh, I had a, my middle kid, he, he was just naturally, he was naturally a baseball player, you know, but he was so fast uh, right out of the gate. My wife ran track or was a high jumper, ran a little track at Ohio State back in the late 70s. As a matter of fact, she had the big t- Ohio State record there for a while uh, in a high jump. And uh, uh, for a long time, actually, she had it. But but my point is, you know, thank God, goodness he was blessed with that. But what is it like? What is it like being basically the fastest guy uh, on a field like through junior high and high school or one of the fastest guys? What is that feeling like for people who've never experienced it? You know, it's cool. Um, I think for me, um, you, you know that if you can run fast, you know that there's always a chance that if you get the ball, you can take it to the house. Right. Yeah. So I think what happens is, is you see a lot of guys who are really fast um, and then they rely on their athleticism uh, and they don't necessarily have great technique um, that goes along with it. Uh, so I think, you know, for me coming out of high school, luckily I had some really good coaches, uh, Coach Miller, uh, Coach Whiting uh, from Brookhaven. Those guys really taught me like, OK, you're the fastest guy. So what that means is, is you need to show that you're the fastest guy every time. So they would not let me take a play off. They would not let me take a sprint off. They were like, you're the fastest guy on the team. So if we're running 40s, you should win every 40. If we're running 200, you should win every 200. And so I kind of got that mentality instilled inside of me of just, okay, if I'm the fastest, I need to make sure I'm always running the fa- as fast as I can because you can kind of lose it. You can kind of get a little rusty at it if you don't use it all the time. And so I was always in really good shape. And then you get to Ohio State and you go up against guys like Joey Galloway, 
Uh, and I'm like, wow, because now I was a fast guy. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Like, that's a whole different speed. And that's a whole, and Chris Sanders and guys that can Butler Bonote uh, and guys like that. I'm like, whoa, like these guys can really fly. So then I had to learn how to take what they were doing and figure out their mechanics to be able to say, okay, I can run with them and I can get my speed to get a little bit more faster to kind of get them, even if I'm not going to be faster than Joey who runs a 41740 and no. probably at 49 could probably still run a 4340, um, you know, just naturally gifted and athletically at just off the charts on in every level. But again, it's just kind of like you, there's always somebody faster. And so I learned technique wise goes a long way, especially as you get as you go up next level, your technique has to be really good at what you want to be able to accomplish because everyone's fast. Like you could you can get away with some things in high school, like, ah, oh, you know what? I'm faster than this guy. Well, college, everyone's fast and everybody can run. And then you get to the NFL, everybody can fly. So the, the thing that separates the good ones are the technique and being able to then film study and how they can diagnose and recognize how, how teams want to attack them. I was going to say, you know, I don't mean to I'm just circle around here, man. Uh, that's kind of what you're seeing a young Ohio State defense kind of coming to grips with, in my opinion, guys who were used to being four and five stars in high school. Uh, basically, they were the big man on campus, the big man on the field fastest man on the field and now there's more to it than being the fastest man on the field as you just pointed out there's technique involved there's recognition involved which is you know part and parcel with technique and you kind of seeing a a really on the defensive side of the ball a lot of people learning on the fly right right I mean and that's the biggest that's that's why when you look at it you have to say what do we do well what 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 does he do well as safety what does he do well at linebacker and then kind of put him in a position to play upon a strength because you need confidence going into a long season. You look at guys that, oh man, if I have a play, all right, how how are they, especially being so young, how are they going to handle the fact that they lost the game early? Can they bounce back? Will they hold on to it? Um, you see a lot of good teams lose. I mean, look at Florida State. Like, you know, <laughs> you, you, you lose, you lose against Notre Dame, then you come back, and then all of a sudden now you, you have the hunger, the hangover, and you lose on the last play to a team that clearly you have more athletic talent. You have more athletic ability. You should beat them. But again, you you play bad technique. I mean, again, just bad technique on a on a hail mary play. Like I don't understand why you're not in the preview anyway, and have so many people in case he catches it, he beats one guy, and then one guy misses a tackle. I'm like, that's it. That's how you lose a game. And so you have to put your guys in a situation to be able to play uh, play with their strengths. And then you kind of cover up their weaknesses and see as they as they get more playing experience, they'll be a lot better. Week week 11 is a lot better than week two. And so that's what you're hoping for. So hopefully they figure out what they do well with that young secondary, that young linebacking core and put them in situations to fly around and make plays, make it a little bit more easier. Because I look at their defense, I'm like, man, you know, there's a lot of checks and a a lot of things to go on. When you have an inexperienced safety, all you need is one wrong check. If he calls it to the wrong side, that's a big play waiting to happen. And yeah. I've been in those situations. I've, I've seen it happen. I've called, I've called the defenses on the wrong side. Like, yeah, that put us in a bad situation. Bad technique. Um, when you're trying to rely on your athletic ability only will get you so far. But if you run 4-4 and I run a 4-4 and I have a step on you, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big play waiting to happen. And I think that's what you're seeing with these young guys is, yes, they're used to dominating guys. But, hey, look, Oregon had guys that, can, that were just as fast and in some cases faster than what we had on the field. And technique was the kind of the thing that the thing that kind of broke the camel's back, so to speak. I was going to say, when it's like versus like, it literally comes down to error of judgment or hesitation, right? I mean, that's, that literally is almost like it's just like auto racing, you know, in some respects. A lot of these cars are exactly the same speed, but one guy just has the audacity or the cunning to put his car in the right place at the right time and, you know, make a yeah. same thing in sport, you know, and uh, uh, wow. Uh, Marlon Kerner. Thanks for joining me, Tim May Podcast, my man. Thanks for having me, Tim. And I'm hopefully I'll come back on eventually sometime again. I'm going to have you again, too, man. I got to see Grant on a few weeks ago, you know, and uh, he even sang Carmen Ohio for him. For him. I'm not going to have you play it on your trumpet. But uh, but see, Grant, you know, a lot of you guys are just my favorite guys coming through, you know, and I, I like to, for one of the term, one of the term recycle, you, recycle you now on a, an all-talk ta- all format. I can't even talk. It's an all-talk <laughs> format. But, Marlon, thanks for joining the Tim May Podcast. Thanks for having me, Tim. Oh, man, I want to thank Marlon Kerner for joining me, man. I'm going to have him, have him on some more, just like I'm going to have C. Grant on and others, man. These guys, he, the former players who have that analytical analytical eye, and a lot of times it's not rose-colored at all, you know, because 
you know, they, they see the black and white of it. You know, they, they, they're not looking for that gray area. They're seeing the black and white of what, what is good, what can be a lot better and what can be a lot better. And maybe from a scheme standpoint, change a few things, but uh, awesome. Uh, you know, really early in this season, the Ohio state defense is at a little bit of a crossroads, both personnel wise and maybe scheme wise. I mean, uh, just let's get your take on that. Yeah. I, you know, I said to you last week and I've said in a lot of places, the people that, uh, didn't believe in Kerry Combs as the defensive coordinator based on what happened last year. Um, and even through the Minnesota game. So, well, there are, there are all these reasons that could justify it or explain it. Obviously they were shorthanded against Alabama. Um, <laughs> they had the whole issue for the entire year of not having spring ball, not having training camp, so many injuries throughout the year. Okay. We've talked about those things, Minnesota, it was a unique scheme, seven offensive linemen, seven first-time starters, um, you know, on and on there, rotating in so much personnel to experiment. And, was, you know, <clears throat> let's see what Ohio State and Kerry Kilms can do when he has the full complement. He still didn't quite get that, um, you know, most of the way there on Saturday. But at this point, <clears throat> he was close enough. Uh, and, I, and Josh Proctor is obviously going to be out for the year. Jerron yeah. Cage wasn't out there. Seven Banks is – you know, dropping NFTs instead of playing uh, on Saturdays. You know, I <laughs> that was a shot it. right there. But go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know what's going. He's not hurt. So, oh, I thought you were going to say you don't know what an NFT is. But go ahead. I do know what an NFT <laughs> is. Uh, and and but you know, you take those three out, and Josh Proctor was you know banged up, and that's not the point. If this is just a trend now. There's no point in at this point three straight times over 30 points allowed the, the yardage racking up like okay it's not something that can be ignored and I wasn't ignoring it but you know it wasn't time to make a final judgment may still not be but it's definitely time to hit some sort of panic button or red alert or have a conversation with Ryan Day and a heart to heart about what they're running who is running it and how they are teaching it because he talks all the time about those three things, the coaching, personnel, and the scheme. That's what he's going to evaluate. Ohio State has problems in all three areas, and that's just the bottom line. That's a simple fact at this point. You know what Woody Hayes would have loved? You know, Woody Hayes was a student of, uh, of, of, of military history as much as anything. He was a student of basically of everything. He would have loved those flanking maneuvers that, uh, <laughs> that uh, Oregon – Joe Moorhead schemed up to run around left end for three touchdowns and then bamboozle Ohio State by, by those guys after they finally kind of figured out what was going on and they were running, finally adjusting and running to the scene of the fire, faking it and throwing the ball to the tight end who ran right by uh, Bryson Shaw, uh, the free safety running up to go to the fire, which wasn't there. That was smoke. The fire was a touchdown pass to the tight end yeah. off the very similar look. Dude, that was like what me and my buddy Mike Lawrence used to do to teams when we'd have these pickup football games. I was a quarterback, and he was my Jack Snow wide receiver kind of guy. We'd set <laughs> guys up and then just, you know, uh, bamboozle them, you know, with a fake here, a nod there, and boom, you're gone. That was a brilliant, in, in many respects, game plan by Joe Moorhead to, to really scratch where House State is, which was number one um, personnel that was inexperienced. And as you and I have talked about, the bane, I think, of this – defense right now is the continual rotation of players into games. I mean, like I said on Channel 10 you know, the other night on Wall to Wall Sports, hey, get your 12 or 14 guys and go with them right now. Let them play like series in a row. You heard Mar Marlon Kerner talk about that, about how difficult it is. You're in there for a series. You're starting to get a feel for how a team is playing against you. I'm talking about defensively, and suddenly you're out of there. And another guy's in there, and now he's learning the same lessons you just learned, and you're watching him learn them the hard way. And, uh, and yeah, it's not – yeah, I think it is that simplistic in a lot of ways. But then the touchdown run to start the second half where you had both your, your one lone high safety, that lone high safety that uh, Ryan Day wants the Ohio, the Ohio State defense to play, it's Bryson Shaw. He lines up uh, uh, on, the, on the – basically right on the right hash mark uh, – the middle linebacker, I think it's Tommy Eichenberg. They're both look like they're both reading the same keys because we all know it was a little zone read option, a uh, handoff to uh, uh, Verdells who goes right up the middle 
because Tommy Eichenberg is all the way over left of, uh, I think it was Taraja Mitchell on the left linebacker side. Bryson Shaw is now three or four steps left of the hash mark, tries to make his move to go get back, at least in Fredell's face, has to run around the umpire to get there, doesn't get there. My point is there's something wrong going on in the teaching aspect of these things because there's no way that that's what you're teaching these guys. So it's a combination of new players and then – Maybe they're looking at the wrong things. Why are they looking at the wrong things? I think that's the question that Ryan Day wants answered, and Ohio State fans clearly want answered. Yeah, I mean, I think you look at, you know, the long touchdown run that you alluded to. Not only were there issues there with, let's say, the angle for Bryson Shaw or whatever Tommy Eichenberg was reading, but, you know, the secondary was not just Bryson Shaw, but the entire secondary was misaligned. They're showing press man coverage against an ineligible wide receiver. So, yeah, uh, you know, those are adjustments. Uh, wait a minute. I'll let that part out because I didn't want him to get an F minus. Go ahead. Well, but it's that's an important part of the equation. Yes. Because it's complete front to back. And I think that <laughs> the reason you kept seeing the same plays over and over was because Ohio State, for whatever reason, whether it was the personnel, whether it was, you know, the choice and scheme, I don't know, you know, We'll, we'll defer to people who've actually lined up for Ohio State to answer that. I do know that you have to check out of that coverage if you are standing over someone who can't even run a route uh, and you're letting yourself, because this happened in other plays where two Ohio State defenders are basically blocking each other, running into each other, and not being touched by an Oregon player because they are misaligned for the formation that is being presented to them. So that's, that's an awareness from – Got to be an awareness in the booth. These guys have been coaching football for a long time. They're, and they're, we're consistently told how sharp Matt Barnes is and Parker Fleming. We know that these guys know football. You know, Kerry Combs, maybe that means, hey, Spencer said this the other day uh, after the game, like maybe he needs to be up in the booth instead of bringing energy for this from the sideline. I hadn't really ever thought about that. But if they are not seeing these things that are football 101, I mean – I don't know what else to say about it. I agree. Yeah. That's not acceptable at Ohio State. Hey, uh, you know, I don't know if uh, if uh, Spencer can zoom in on this photo. I'm fixing to hold in front of my camera. But uh, this is one of the touchdowns on that, what I call left-end sweep. Uh, and uh, you can see what you said. You can see barely. You can make it out a little bit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that maybe Ohio State – uh, in a coaching move, needs to call Roto Rooter because the problem. The problem is some really fantastic audio for yeah, our podcast yeah. only people. Yeah, but the, <laughs> the but the bottom line is, like Marlon Kerner said, you know that that what 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 they were referring to after the game there, you know, kind of like football speak, crack, fill. Yeah. Basically, the the wide receiver over that over that or excuse me, the defensive back over the wide receiver there on that left side of the on that left side of the formation, which is the boundary side of the formation, the shorter side of the field, when he realizes this guy is going to throw a block, he's going to crack, hopefully throw an illegal crack block on the on what would be a pursuing linebacker on a sweep left because they're pulling guys. You know, you can see the offensive linemen that have pulled. They pulled different numbers of guys, too. It was really cool when you really study it. It was it was it was genius in a lot of ways. If in fact any kind of football coaching is genius, <laughs> but uh, you've got to instantly realize you've got to see that receiver's eyes. You've got to call crack or whatever you want to call it. You know, sky's falling. Whatever you want to call it, the code, and you've got to immediately go out there and try to set the edge. The main thing you want the uh, running back to not have is just a free run around the corner. And Ohio State got bamboozled on it not once, not twice, but three times. And then, like I said, the fourth time. They they thought they had it. They thought they had it figured out, and boom, yeah. touchdown pass to the tight end who feigns a block and uh, stands up and c- catches a TD pass uh, from a quarterback who looked uh, average at best the week before. I mean, yeah, I well, think got out coached uh, on Saturday. <laughs> and he still was pretty average in this game. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's the crazy part. Yeah, well, that's the, he didn't have to be great. I mean, he just had to throw certain passes, make certain plays, and uh, right. and yet through all that. Uh, Let's give credit where credit's due. The defense did get Ohio State a couple of stops here in the fourth quarter, gave the offense a chance, you know. But like we talked about after the game, we're still talking about now, when you've got to be almost perfect because you've blown some earlier chances, you didn't kick field goals, 
you went for you went for first downs and possibly leading to touchdowns earlier in the game and stuff. Now you've got to be semi-perfect or definitely excellent. And Ohio State's offense suddenly wasn't excellent when it really needed it the most, uh, despite the ridiculous offensive uh, passing display by C.J. Stroud, who was named, by the way, second straight uh, week, the freshman offensive or the freshman uh, player of the week in the Big Ten, uh, four, over 400 yards passing, uh, and it still wasn't good enough, you know. Uh, Wow. Uh, now you're playing Tulsa. Uh, Tulsa, everybody's, you know, everybody's talking about Tulsa because they got beat by UC Davis, an FCS school in the opener. Well, Tulsa was leading uh, Oklahoma State in the third quarter this past weekend uh, before Oklahoma State got its act together and won that game uh, narrowly. Uh, this is a Tulsa team that's looking at the same video of the high state defense that, that everybody else is going to be looking at from the first two games. You know, uh, they, they can do some things offensively. Uh, I don't think you, I don't think you can right now declare Ohio State's going to squash anybody from a defensive standpoint. <laughs> well, yeah, all we know for sure, Tim, is that Ohio State's going to score a ton of points. Like, yeah, or at least put up a lot of yardage and drive the field pretty pretty casually between the twenties. Now, uh, as you said, they weren't perfect in that game. They were much, 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 much closer. Um, obviously. They'd want those three in a row fourth down conversions back. It's yeah. weird. It's weird, as I said early on in this podcast, that to not see Ohio State's offensive line uh, dominate, get any push up front. You know, they tried to run it there on a fourth and two. I believe Mayan Williams and and got nothing. Yeah. Um, got gotcha. shot. Yeah. Yeah. You know, another one where the protection kind of broke down on the throw to Olave in the end zone. Um, maybe he was interfered with, maybe not. You and I, you know, I think it could have gone either way. I, I, we didn't, I think he was. I mean, you know, the, you know, but go ahead. Yeah, I, you know, I, you don't want to be put in that situation. No. But, so C.J. Stroud was trying to improvise, and I think Olave had to try and cut it back to make something happen, and then you know goes down that way, and yeah, uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, the offensive line will have to come in for some of that. Uh, C.J. Stroud doesn't just escape scot free. He was th- high on some throws. I don't know if that's related to the shoulder. He said he was well, you know, feeling well enough to play. That's all that mattered. So, you know, you take, he's not going to make excuses for that. And then the interception late, Jeremy Rucker drops a touchdown that maybe this game looks completely different. Um, there were other drops that, you know, we saw Chris Olave, uh, Garrett Wilson, you know, changed over on that little seam route over the middle. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, but he got hit pretty good on that play. Yeah. They're not all easy catches. And I'm yeah. not saying you have to catch every single football, but Jeremy Ruckert's one is is implanted in my brain that you say that you're the best. Uh, well, he, he doesn't ever say this. I, I, I keep saying it. Yeah. You <laughs> and I say he's the best tight end in the country. Well, yeah. that's a catch that the best tight end in the country has to make. He was not hit that hard. Now I wouldn't want to be hit at all like that, but for somebody with his skills, ball skills and toughness and the willingness, like all those things that make him a great tight end, that's a play that has to simply be made. So, um, you know, they weren't perfect on that side of the football, but they were definitely good enough to yeah. win a football game, in my opinion, on Saturday. That that offense is going to be just fine. Oh, I agree. I mean, you know, like you just said, though, they 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 almost had to be perfect there, though, based on what yeah. was going on the other side. And But like I've, like I've said many times, those kind of games, it's just like a tennis match, a big-time tennis match. Okay, you know, the other team scored. Now you've got the ball. You know, you've got to hold serve. You know, that's literally what those – some of those – you're going to get in those kind of games during – you look at Alabama and Ole Miss last year, you know. That team went on to win the national championship in a, in a fairly impressive fashion. But Alabama could have been beaten at Ole Miss last year because – but the reason they didn't is because they held serve finally to the end and Ole Miss didn't. And, you know, that, that holding call against uh, Thayer Munford – you know, behind C.J. Stroud, who was scrambled for a first down there late. Uh, that's as big a play as any in, in the deal. Yeah. And you watch the replay and you go, wow, it wasn't holding. I even asked if they remember after the game about it. And he basically he basically indicated he put himself in a bad position as far as what the official was going to see, you know, which is, man, you got to be thinking about that, you know, in the midst of a game. You know, that's called your Q rating, I guess. You know, that's what you and I have to deal with being on these videos. But uh, well, and, and that it's one, crazy though, isn't it, to hear that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I did not think that that was holding, but that I didn't either. It doesn't, you know, the 
back to your point about it, you know, trying to hold serve in the way that, you know, college football is really played anymore. Some of the, even Alabama embracing, uh, you know, tempo offense and high scoring games that you, you don't even need a tr- silver bullets that give up seven points a game or 10 points a game. Like that's probably gone. What you need is uh, someone who can maybe force you two or three turnovers or get some sacks that, to make it more difficult to convert in third and long or what, you know, yes. you only need to do that a, a couple of times, especially with as good as Ohio state's offense is. So the frustrating part for Ryan day to watch here, and this did start at Minnesota is when you can't get off the field to put the offense even out there. So obviously the points and yards are a problem, but you know, the 40 minutes of, of possession <laughs> that Minnesota had or the ease with which Oregon could move, you know, move the chains with their rushing attack, that's a big problem because you have to get, create a turnover, get a sack to tilt the field just a little bit so that you can get the one or two broken serves that make the difference. You know, this is not, you know, you're, you're just not going to play 13 to 10 games in the Big Ten or anywhere anymore. Nope. And so that, I think that's the mystifying part is that to do that, you probably need to have a more aggressive approach, whether that means blitzing or different – you know, coverages to try and catch the quarterback off balance and force an interception. And I don't, I just don't remember seeing a single blitz on Saturday. Maybe I'm wrong. I wasn't really tracking it for every, every single snap. I wish I would have now. Uh, I'll have to go back and, and rewatch from that part. But they, they were not an aggressive blitzing team. They were not changing uh, many different looks in the secondary, which they rarely have recently. Um, so, as a consequence of that, you don't see any turnovers. Like that's, I, that's the problem is that Ohio state was not taking it to, to the Oregon offense and trying to dictate terms and force them to make a play happen where maybe mistakes come along. And that's, that's the part that's unusual to see from Ohio state. I think uh, if, if you'd watch that video, I'm talking about you, I'm talking about folks out there. If you watch the video of Fresno state versus Oregon, I think Ohio state had an inclination. It could get pressure with just his front four. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of blitzing. There was some blitzing. There wasn't a lot of blitzing going on. But if you watch the way the Fresno State defensive front at times got pressure, I mean, why wouldn't Ohio State get pressure? As Maurice Claret said, don't tell me about your stars, you know, make plays, you know. I'm paraphrasing his tweet. But he's right. I mean, uh, maybe we've over – what's that word uh, Spencer likes to use? Over. We've been too over-hyperbolic on this group. I'm not kidding you. And until they prove it, you know, okay, if it's not the scheme, then it's the players. If it's not the players, then it's the scheme. You follow me? I mean, something is not adding up here. The, and uh, that's or that's the, the, star, the stars have not aligned. There we go. Go ahead. They have it. I mean, I mean, that's that's true as well. That's why I say it's not all of one thing or all of two things that, that they're looking at. It's all three of them. And Zach Harrison and Tyreek Smith should be winning a lot of one-on-one matchups. Um, I thought Haskell Garrett, you know, and Teron Vincent played pretty well on Saturday. Burn was, I did too. Burn was a little bit harder on them from his vantage point on the field, and I'm not going to argue that because none of them were really making many plays in the backfield. Wait, let me follow. Let me quick interject. For example, on one of those uh, sweeps, the uh, sweep left for one of the touchdowns, Teron Vincent takes his man and runs him all the way out to the edge. I mean, all the way into the flat, yeah. uh, which should have extended – the play, except there was nobody coming. You know, there was no cavalry behind Teron yeah. Vincent. It was just Teron Vince. Teron Vincent, I thought, had some really good moments on Saturday. But go back to what you said. They didn't put it all together in the sense of getting to Anthony Brown. Well, they did. They did pressure a few pretty good. Javante Jean Baptiste, I remember, had a pressure to bad pass at a key moment. You know, in the fourth quarter. Yeah. Yeah, but it was too too few and far between. Is it what you're talking about, right? Yeah, because you know. The way I understand this approach with the single high safety is that yeah. you're counting on getting a lot of pressure without having to blitz. And that's great when you have Chase Young. We talked about this on you and I, Tim, I, uh, on Saturday. Yeah. How much they may miss Jeff Halfley and in, in his knowledge and expertise of this system. But he also, when he was running it, had the benefit of one of the best pass rushers in Ohio State history, if not the best. Yeah. Uh, certainly. You know, certainly on the Mount Rushmore of Rushman. Uh, he, <laughs> hey, I like where you said that. Go ahead. Now. So, you know, 
that's up to, you know, Zach Harrison always says he doesn't want to be compared to the Boses and, and Chase Young. Well, you know, if we're going to call it like it is, he can't be compared with them right now. Yep. He's not playing close to their level. Tyreek Smith, um, you know, he has these for these first two games uh, has not matched the productivity that he showed the last time he was on the field against Clemson. Um, those two guys and Javante Jean Baptiste just they have to win more one on one matchups. That's what this entire scheme is really built around when you're not, I mean, getting pressure and, and when letting things work back from there. That, that may be oversimplifying it, but that's just a fact of life that they don't want to be dialing up a ton of blitzes, but they may have to if this is the amount of pressure that Ohio State's going to get from that front four, which is it's not good enough. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. You just you put the nail on the head, though. There are all kinds of things going on. But, man, what, what really just sticks in my mind how repeatedly on three different plays uh, how Oregon was able to cause that log jam in the middle of the pursuit to the edge uh, yeah. by lack of recognition by maybe the coverage guy who then took out linebackers. I mean, one time it, it blocked two guys. You know, one guy blocked two guys. I'm talking about the receiver. One, the other time, effectively, he blocked three guys. You know, one of those guys chasing at one point was uh, linebacker uh, Palier Neoteote, you know, and obviously he wasn't an instant quick fix for whatever was wrong <laughs> with Ohio State's defense because it wasn't his fault he got caught up in the wash because the wash shouldn't have been there, you know. If you're playing reactive, uh, quick reactive defense, because you got to, you know, you got to play what's happening. You can't play – you know, my assignment and now I'm done. You know, you've got to you've got to deal with what's going on right what you're seeing and, and what's going on right in front of your face. And a lot of times Ohio State's defense is not doing that or it's seeing ghosts, you know, to a certain extent. Like I said, on the long run to start the second half. Oh my goodness, man. And uh when you when you when a when an offensive coordinator can get you thinking like that, thinking about things that aren't there, you know, you've got to you got a real problem on your hands, and so let's get let's get to the brass tacks here before we're done, because a lot of people want to hear us, I think, discuss this. Uh, we've been around this program for a long time. I've been around a lot longer than you. Uh, uh, Trying to remember if there was ever a coaching change in the middle of the season that really mattered. Uh, I'm talking about from an assistant coaching standpoint, and you know, I, I can't re- really remember one. Maybe. Maybe it's because I'm 67 years old, but, you know, what happens with Kerry Combs now? I mean, do they really have a guy on their staff, their full-time staff, that's a defensive coordinator that would be able to go in there with a magic wand and change things? Or is it all about how things are being taught? And does that all fall on Kerry Combs? Give me your answer. I'll give you mine. Boy, there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of layers to, to uh, peel through there, Tim. And it's, I mean, if they truly, if Ryan Day truly wanted to and was ready to be done with someone that he knows and trusts and respects and wanted to bring back to do this role after 10 games, I mean, Paul Rhodes is in the building and has defensive coordinator experience and could be elevated to that role. They are, Ohio State is in a different position currently than – historically is the case for college football teams, which is why you don't see coordinators and assistants fired in the middle of the year. Everybody already has jobs and there aren't people on the street who can come in and coach at a high level. uh, And you're not going to take somebody off of another uh, roster coaching roster in the middle of the season. So they, they do have, if that was something they wanted to do an option for that, but that I don't believe would fix it because they don't just have another training camp around the corner. They, they do play Tulsa and Akron in the next two weeks, and they could do just about anything they wanted to and win those games, you would figure, based on uh, the d- dramatically wide talent margin between Yeah, let me interrupt you. But Mar- you know, Marlon and I talked about these, you remember, and but would that be a false, a false read, you know? I mean, we're talking about like opponents. We're talking about getting it fixed, so when you go against a like opponent, which they should – there's a couple of chances of that later on in the year, but go ahead though. You, you're, you're going along with what I'm thinking there. Yeah, you can't. I mean, just because you could play two safeties on Saturday and, and a week from Saturday doesn't mean that that's fixed your issues by the time that you play 
Uh, I mean, Maryland's offense will provide a challenge uh, in the middle of October, you'd think. Um, at least it's trending that way. The only truly talent equated game is still not until uh, the night before Halloween. Yeah. So, yeah, Ohio State should be able to win these games without that. But the, what you're talking about with the false sense of security, I mean, you may you may try some stuff now and you think, oh, gosh, it looks great um, against Tulsa or Akron. You know, that doesn't mean that it's going to be college football playoff worthy. But the part that makes it challenging, whether you're talking about replacing Kerry Combs in season, which I, to be clear, I have zero percent expectation that that would happen. I, I agree. Not, percent, but go ahead, though. I do not think that that is is in the cards. But even even in the hypothetical where it was. Well, now you're talking about the exact same situation of a year ago where you're in September without having having had uh, March and April and and the offseason meetings and training camp to drill a two safety system or a quarter system or anything else you can think of that that you want to play defensively. You, You can't just install that on a whim in three days or even two weeks when you've built everything else around this other system. Yes. So, you know, the answer is going to have to come in the execution of that or, you know, having more change-ups around it, whether that's mixing up coverages, throwing in blitzes, I don't know. But I think based on what you and I have heard, just had a former Buckeye on this show, the ones that I've talked to who've been experienced in this and know a hell of a lot more, infinitely more really, um, X's and O's than I do, it's going to have to come from the single high system and it's going to have to be better execution. It's going to have to be determining which players your best are your best players and letting them go. Uh, and then, you know, being able to adjust and coach um, the techniques and, and recognition and checks and communication and all that, like all three of those things are all tied together for this. It is not just a one thing solution yeah. and it's not solely on Kerry Combs because I think there's a part of him the responsibility falls for him, but Ryan Day chose him and said, this is the system that you want to run. I'm not convinced that this is fully the system that Kerry Combs is most comfortable with. Now he knows football, knows how to do it, but is he as comfortable with the single high as Jeff Halfley? I would have to say no. Yeah. You know, and as we sit here right now, you know, in that abbreviated season of last year, what bothered you was plays getting out the gate, you know, Safety, a safety not being there for whatever reason, you know, or not being able to get there, if not being there, you know, uh, kind of the same questions right now is Bryson Shaw is not the same player as Josh Proctor. I think Bryson Shaw is a pretty sharp player, but uh, he's clearly learning on the job. But uh, I'm just wondering right now, uh, as we as we sit here, we're talking late, late Monday afternoon on another game week. Do you look at somebody else, for example, do you? Who would be – if you could put your ideal four personnel back there right now in the secondary without without the bullet, okay? But but you know what? They're, that was their primary uh, lineup on Saturday was with the bullet in there or with the fifth defensive back in there. Yeah. Who would be your four – who would be your four best defenders in the secondary right now if you could put your finger on it? This isn't sliding others. This is just naming who you think are worthy. Ones that should be on the field. Yeah. Cam, Brown, Cam Brown and Denzel Burke must be on the field as much as they are capable of. Agreed. I know, I know that Kerry Combs loves to rotate corners, and we've seen them be very successful with three of them. Now, those were also three first-round draft picks, but that's beside the point. Agreed. If you're going to play three, I, you know, Cam Brown, Denzel Burke, and then Ryan Watts for me. But Ryan Watts wasn't really part of the plan on Saturday, and I don't, I don't understand why. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was something that they must have liked about Legend Cavazos for that to try and defend that look, and it did not work, just nope. to be completely honest. But so I think you need to play Cam Brown uh, and Denzel Burke as much as possible. Lathan Ransom uh, is a playmaker and a force. Now the question is, with this system, do you, you've you invested a lot. Again, I'll keep saying that. A lot of reps, a lot of time, a lot of energy making him that cover safety. Is it is it possible – He's very good. Does, is he comfortable making that move? Does he have the body type? Uh, you know, after everything else you've done with the reps, can he play in the field safety role? I don't know. You probably have to think about it um, because he did come to play that initially at Ohio State. But 
the, and the four, guy who's played best, not counting Josh Proctor, I think is Ronnie Hickman. Agreed. And, and he could play in that safety role if we're talking about that traditional, traditional to you know twin safety look, which I don't think is really going to be part of the solution. But those are the four best. The X factor in all of this, Tim, and it seemed like coming out of camp that Court Williams was ready to go. Um, now, there were day, several days where he was had ice bags on the knee, and I asked him about that specifically the last time he was available. It was like, right. are, you, are you ready to go? And he said he was. Uh, now, there's also been a suggestion to me that there was a, a setback during camp, that those ice bags were there for a reason. Um, he's not played in the last two weeks, and he was ready to be a starter a year ago, or at least in that top rotation, before the ACL injury, he's not played at all. And at yeah. some point, if this secondary is going to get rolling, I think Court Williams has to be part of that as well. Isn't it? Isn't it it's just ironic that Josh Proctor, you know, I think Josh Proctor wanted to play in that game on Saturday too. I mean, you could tell, you yeah. know, coming off that shoulder bang the week before and then suffers that what we do believe was a broken leg, lower, lower leg. Um, it's not – it's just it's just uncanny sometimes how the hammer hits your thumb, you know. <laughs> and uh, I'm talking I'm told, about. I, I'm going to throw it in here right now. Uh, I'm told directly that Josh Proctor is planning to return to Ohio State next year. Wow. Uh, haven't said that anywhere else. I mean, he's going to be out for the year, but he is not. I, I've written this. I said, "Well, is this a career-ending injury?" I was told, "No." Uh, as long as he's healthy, he will return to the Buckeyes. Yeah. But my point, you've you've heard me. I've been talking about Josh Proctor for three years, yep. right? Just looking forward to this moment in time when it was going to be sort of his, for one of another term, his secondary. You know, <laughs> and uh, the guy that's come closest to looking like that kind of player to me has been Ronnie Hickman. I've liked that energy he's shown. Lathan Ransom, yeah, he had that unfortunate uh, what face mask uh, penalty, and what was that the fourth quarter the other day? Uh, but. I thought he showed a lot of energy out there, a lot of want to, you know, for one of another term. I think Bryson Shaw, there's no, there's uh, a reason why he's, he and he, and he was playing for Proctor. There's a reason why he's looked good in practice and stuff. Uh, but, you know, is the energy there that you want or the awareness there that you want immediately in a game, you know, in a game situation, a lot of times he's late to the party, you know, he's your free safety you know, kind of you want him late to the party, but you don't want a free safety <laughs> chasing a guy, you know. That's what you saw last year. You want the free safety taking great angles and hitting the guy on the great angle. And uh, now it takes a lot of experience to get to that point. I understand that. But like right now, Ronnie Hickman just brings that sort of like that little extra, uh, what the French call a certain I don't know what, you know, to the situation. And so that's what I'd be looking at. And uh, I'd really be looking at that linebacker group, man, uh, who are my two best, uh, maybe three best linebackers, and just playing them? Uh, I think that's as big a quandary as there is right now. Well, think about it. This is what I've been thinking about, Tim, is that Tar Taraja Mitchell and Cody Simon are the two best linebackers. Agreed. Who's the third one? Boy, well, I think it's still Ronnie Hickman. Um, yeah, there you go. You're going to have to cop out. <laughs> um, I mean, probably – you know, using Hickman or Craig Young more would be, but yeah. Kayvon, Pope, Kayvon Pope, when he is on the field, I t he did this two years ago when he was coming off the bench and he made those interceptions. He has an ability You're right. to get his hand in passing lanes. He's a good blitzer. And I, there are things about Kayvon Pope that I understand why Ohio State is reluctant to rely on him. Uh, but – Put him in a game, and you see what happens. Yeah, uh, there's going to have to be some element of this where Ohio State has to get uncomfortable because athletically, you know, Kayvon Pope has everything you need, and if he misses an assignment once or twice, he may have the ability to make up for that. Tyvis Palach told this story. I don't know if it was on Letterman Live or not about Darren Lee and how they would have conversations of, "Hey, you're you might have to make them right sometimes." Him and Joey Bosa, who we brought up. They might not get every assignment correct, but they give you something else in that upside. And, and if they do make a mistake, they have a chance to make up for it. Kayvon Pope, I'm not saying he's Darren Lee, but he might be this team's version of that yeah. um, to help them. I, I guess the point is that 
if you're constantly taking these linebackers off the field, then you're taking off your defensive quarterback. Um, and the person who is relaying the signals or making the checks or trying to get other people aligned, you know, that's your yes. linebacker. That's their job. Yeah. So if you're going with these crazy substitutions, you don't have any of that consistency. You don't have any of that familiar voice. You don't have, uh, you know, guys jerking them by the, the face mask, tell them to get over here. Like, I just – I don't understand taking off your linebackers. I, I don't see anyone else in the country doing that. Here's the fault that lies at the feet of Kerry Combs and his defensive coaches and possibly Ryan Day is after a full spring, after a full preseason camp, you still – based on the way you've played personnel, you still don't have that back seven yeah. that – that you call your boy, that's the rock back seven. Maybe you saw it a little bit at the end of the game last week. Uh, but if, you know, then something's wrong. I mean, the, the evaluation period has, you know, yeah, you want to see these guys in real action because, like you pointed out, six or seven new starters. Are you crazy? That's crazy yeah. for anybody to deal with. But, you know, it's time to name names, you know, <laughs> and put them out there and to see if they can walk the walk. The talk has been used by all of us, you know, following these guys. Like I said, going back to the stars and all this kind of stuff, the, the recruiting stars and, and stuff. But uh, that's just talk. You know, the walk is what matters. And right now they're one of the, they're one of the worst defenses in the country against yeah. the run. You know, who wouldn't want to line up and run against these guys based on the last, the last two games we've seen, the sample size we've seen? Who, what, exactly. what offense wouldn't want to do that? Tulsa's going to try to do that on Saturday. We'll see what, what can happen. Uh, uh, but it, you know, and then – Hitting big passes in big in big moments. Uh, that's what Oregon did the other day. Yeah, uh, it's it's not the kind of defense you expect, and uh, from an Ohio State, uh, and and I think fans are right to be a little bit perplexed. Media is right to be a little bit perplexed about what's going on from an evaluation standpoint, from a starting lineup standpoint, and from a man all alive. Can't you just let uh, a couple of guys play three series in a row, just to, in a row, just to get a feel for the thing? I think that's my big question about the whole, whole situation. Yeah. You want, I mean, this isn't a new formula. We've no. been watching football and covering it for a long time. Go out there, win the game in the first half. If you have a talent advantage, I'm not saying that was going to be the case against Oregon, but then let your subs play in the third quarter and evaluate more. If somebody makes a move and impresses you there and those reps, when the other team still has a starting offense out there, great. All right, maybe you find something else out at linebacker. But you have to win the game first. And Ohio State wasn't doing that against Minnesota. They sure weren't doing it against Oregon. And this is another opportunity. They're, they're probably really tempted to keep doing that against Tulsa and Akron. But now, guess what? They don't have the ability to do that because they have to win the game and take care of what try and keep somebody happy later. The part, the stuff where they talk about, they have these hard conversations about earning playing time and, and tough love and, and fight and all this other stuff. You can't say that on the one hand and then play your entire roster in the first half and the second. Yeah. You have starters. They have to play and win the game for you. And they're not, I don't understand why that's not happening. Uh, I'm looking around. I'm trying to find somebody to pass the plate, you know, because <laughs> the sermon is done. The sermon yeah. is done, and I'm I'm saying amen. I was I was trying to keep from interrupting you there because you know I do get in trouble for that for going yes you know like Ed McMahon or something or amen. <laughs> so I tried not to do that, but now past the plate, I think we could get a lot of contributions and help the on three uh, and Letterman Row sites. You know, just continue to bring yeah. excellence. One year for ten dollars, just pass it over there. Yeah, there you go. That's a that's a hell of a bargain when you look at that site, man. That's all I got to say. I'm not. I didn't get paid for that. Well, I guess I did get paid for that endorsement, <laughs> but I digress. Hey, awesome. I uh, want to thank you. I want to thank Marlon Kerr, who pretty much uh, had the same sermon, you know, during his uh, during his time with me. I really was a real enlightening uh, conversation with Marlon Kerr, former cornerback at Ohio State who played in the NFL and has some, uh, has some cred, in my opinion, has a lot of cred. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll be back next week. And after – and then next week maybe we'll be talking about how Ohio State – is bouncing back into that national picture. You know what I mean? After you hear, you see all these other teams that beat uh, beat semi nobodies uh, over the weekend, and suddenly they're one of the best teams you've ever seen, right? You know, and uh, no. is fixed. yeah, it's not it's not who you it's not who 
who you are is who you play that makes the difference, you know, and uh, I got that wrong, but I think folks out there have learned to follow me on that. But uh, awesome. Thanks for joining me again, my man. Anytime, buddy. And until next week, ladies and gentlemen, this is Tim May Podcast. We will see you then.